Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Civil Commitment and the Mental Health Care Continuum, Historical Trends and Principles for Law and Practice, sponsored by SAMHSA and presented on behalf of the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors, otherwise known as NASPID. My name is Kelly Mastin from NASHBID, and I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping items I'd like to go over. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording along with the PowerPoint presentation slides will be sent via email to all those who registered. However, you may download the PowerPoint slides now at your convenience at the top of the screen where it says Files. For those who need closed captioning today, you will see closed captioning available for you, also at the top of the screen where it says CC. Please know that all lines are currently muted. If you are having any technical difficulties during this webinar, please type your comments in the Q&A pod, Q&A and chat pod on the right side of your screen and someone will be able to assist you. Please also type your questions for the presenters in that pod, and at the end of the presentation, we will ask as many as we can. At the end of the webinar, please take a few moments to complete a short evaluation for us. On the evaluation screen, you will see a letter of attendance that you may download. Please note that we do not offer CEU credits for our webinars. Should you have any questions, my email address will be available at the top of the screen during the evaluation. I would like to thank SAMHSA again for allowing us to share this information with you today, and thank you for joining us. Today's presenters are Dr. Jeffrey Swanson of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Duke University School of Medicine, and Larry Fitch from the University of Maryland Law School, Affiliated Faculty, Institute of Law, Psychiatry and Public Policy at University of Virginia. Thank you to our presenters, and I will now turn it over to Larry Fitch. Thank you, Kelly, and thanks to NASHBID, thanks to SAMHSA for sponsoring this event uh, and for sponsoring the work that led up to this event. It was a day-long conference on civil commitment three years ago in, in Rockville, folks from around the country who gathered and, and talked about uh, you know, reforms, what, how to, to make uh, the civil commitment process work best. Uh, and then uh, they also sponsored the work that Jeff and I did following up on that conference uh, and preparing a paper, sort of synthesizing the results of that conference uh, and offering up uh, guidelines for states to, uh, to look to, to improve their commitment laws and, and their commitment practices. So thanks to, uh, to SAMHSA, thanks to Nashville. Our goal today, what we plan to do, uh, is to uh, talk a little uh, about the history of civil commitment, uh, the way these laws have come about, what they look like now. Uh, we'll talk about dangerousness and the role of dangerousness in determining an individual's uh, committability. Uh, we'll talk about uh, sort of the place of commitment in the continuum of care uh, and how it may serve as a sort of a portal to services for folks uh, who have, have mental illnesses. We'll talk about uh, some of the research that's been done on how folks do uh, who've been through commitment, uh, how they experience uh, the process, uh, and how they fare. Uh, and finally, we'll offer up these guidelines. We'll summarize some of the guidelines for implementing commitment uh, in a way that's fair and respectful. So uh, that's our plan over the next uh, hour or so. I'm going to begin uh, with a look at inpatient commitment, talk for maybe 20, 25 minutes, and then Jeff will uh, focus on uh, issues in outpatient commitment or assisted outpatient treatment. And we hope to leave about a half an hour at the end for uh, questions and for discussion. So that's our plan. Um, uh, I'm using a new technology it takes me a few minutes to figure out what to do. Okay, uh, let's begin by looking at, at commitment generally. Uh, and we're talking about laws that allow the state to lock people uh, in, uh, confine people in locked facilities. It's something like what we do in, in the criminal justice system, but for a, a very different purpose. What, I mean, this is not on the slide, but just I'm kind of curious, and I guess you can't respond to me, but if we were all in the room together, I would ask the group of you uh, just to say, uh, in a nutshell, what the essential standard is for commitment these days. Uh, what is it that we look for uh, in determining whether someone needs to be hospitalized? Uh, and I think what you would say is dangerousness. And it's what everyone replies whenever, you know, I talk about commitment. I sort of pose this question at the outset, and that seems to be what everyone says, that it's, 
dangerousness has become the standard for commitment. But I would argue it's not. Uh, that the standard for commitment uh, is need for treatment. It's always been need for treatment. We're talking about selecting people for placement in a treatment setting, in a psychiatric hospital for psychiatric care. Uh, and that's the purpose of commitment, and that's essentially the standard for commitment. Dangerousness has come into the law, and we'll talk about this, uh, beginning in the late 60s into the 70s, uh, but not, as a, not for the purpose of expanding commitment to allow the state to sweep up people who may be dangerous but not in need of treatment, but rather to select among those folks who have psychiatric illness and have a, a need for treatment, whose need for treatment is so great as to it put, put them at some risk of harm to themselves or others. You know, I think that's the idea here, because after all, I mean, civil commitment is for purposes of treatment. In the criminal justice system, very different. Uh, we use that to contain people whose risks are too high, or sometimes to punish people for what they've done, commit uh, deserts for, you know, their behavior. Uh, in the civil commitment system, you know, the behaviors are more broadly defined. Uh, the procedures are relaxed uh, relatively. It's, it's legalistic, and we'll talk about how it's become more legalistic over the years. Uh, but it's still not quite like what we do in the criminal justice system. And, of course, the duration of confinement within the criminal justice system these days typically is a fixed sentence. A person uh, does the crime uh, and does the time. Uh, with civil commitment, the period of confinement is indeterminate. It's uh, determined by how long the person requires the services that uh, the person's placed to, to receive. Um, commitment laws uh, that I'm going to talk about in the next 20 minutes or so are pretty new. Uh, they're certainly uh, they're certainly no older than psychiatric hospitals, and we haven't had psychiatric hospitals that long. In Old England, uh, you know, what would be done with someone who had a serious mental illness? The, the king could step in, could take the person's land, could use the profits from that land to provide for their care, often to uh, to, to, to enable a family to provide for their kids. This was used both for people with intellectual disabilities uh, and for people with mental illnesses. Uh, in colonial America, you know, we didn't even have that uh, in place, really no infrastructure to oversee services for people with mental disabilities. So it became the responsibility uh, ultimately of the family. And if the family uh, was not responsible, you know, folks would uh, band together and there are reports of people roving through the countryside. Uh, in roving bands of people with mental illnesses, picked up periodically by, you know, uh, the authorities, and typically taken and placed into the adjacent state, taken across state lines, so then the next state would have to deal with them. Uh, if, if folks landed in courthouses, almshouses, sometimes in jails, uh, and then beginning in the late uh, 1700s and really picking up in the late 1800s, the first psychiatric hospitals. Uh, asylums for the services for, for the care of folks with serious mental illnesses. The first hospital in Williamsburg, if you visit Williamsburg, Virginia, as a tourist, it's, it's interesting. You can tour the facility uh, and see the level of care uh, that was available in 1773. Uh, but there was a recognition that, you know, the care that people were receiving generally uh, who had uh, mental illnesses, you know, the fact that people were receiving literally no care and were winding up in alms, alms houses and poor houses, uh, led a lot of reformers to press for states to develop institutions, uh, and they did. And by the late 1800s, there were lots of these scattered all across the country uh, for the, uh, the placement of folks with serious mental illnesses. Uh, the early commitment procedures were pretty informal. Uh, you know, a family would bring someone to a facility. Uh, they'd be evaluated by the staff there. And if the staff felt they could benefit from treatment, they would be placed. It would be sort of a substituted judgment. Uh, on their behalf, others would make the decision, this is someone who requires treatment, and the person would be admitted for treatment. Uh, there were some procedural reforms uh, instituted in the late 1800s, few states even requiring trial by jury. Uh, but most states, it was pretty informal, pretty relaxed. No clear legal standard other than that the person would benefit from the treatment that was offered. Uh, and that's the way it was pretty much uh, through the 1960s. Uh, these facilities, again, uh, emerging in the 1800s. So for 60, 70 years, uh, it was a pretty lax process. Anyone could be admitted on a finding that they needed treatment. There was uh, a proposed law in 1951. Uh, that would uh, turn on considerations of incompetence. If someone had a need for treatment and was incompetent to make a choice, that would be grounds for their commitment. Uh, but it would be a metal, medical model for their placement uh, without 
uh, court involvement. So the consequence, folks were admitted, these facilities were built, uh, and the numbers piled up. You can see that uh, by the mid-1950s, there were nearly 600,000 people uh, in state hospitals, uh, fewer than 40,000 today, uh, however. Uh, and so the question is, what happened? Um, is it all about changes in commitment law, or what are the forces that have resulted in this level of deinstitutionalization of care for folks with mental disorders? Now, the first thing, and maybe the most important of all, is that in the mid-50s, the first really effective treatments for psychiatric illness appeared. Uh, you know, the antipsychotic medications, Thorazine, and, and the medications that followed, uh, that enabled a lot of folks who had, you know, lived their lives in institutions for the first time to have the opportunity to leave uh, and to, uh, to make it uh, outside the walls of an institution. Uh, and so those had a huge impact. And then in, uh, you know, the 60s during the Kennedy administration, the Community Mental Health Act, uh, encouraging states to serve people in less restrictive settings. Uh, that it's not necessary in every case, particularly with the uh, availability of effective drugs for everyone to remain uh, hospitalized. And at the same time, of course, so many other folks who found themselves in state hospitals in those days getting care in other settings, so people with epilepsy, uh, people with intellectual disabilities who uh, had been just simply dumped, warehoused in, in uh, psychiatric institutions for years, now being placed in more suitable settings. Uh, and then Medicaid coming in in 1965 and the IMD rule, the Institution for Middle Disease rule, uh, allowing or providing for the feds to subsidize care uh, for folks with mental illnesses, uh, people who are poor, but only uh, in the community, not within state institutions for mental disease. Uh, and so that provided lots of financial incentive for states to, to deinstitutionalize care, to find and set up services outside facilities uh, to provide care where the feds would pick up part of the cost. And then these laws uh, began to appear in the late 60s, California among the first, uh, and then over the next five or six years, by the mid-70s, most states had enacted a, a law uh, making it a little harder uh, to commit. We're going to talk about these laws uh, in some detail. But it all happened in the period of about five or six years from the late 60s through the mid-70s. But you'll see that by 1975, there was already deinstitutionalization from a population of, you know, 550,000 down to about 200,000, driven largely by these other forces, uh, by uh, the emergence of effective treatments uh, and the financial incentive for states to develop services and programs outside institutions that would be partly subsidized by the feds. Um, but we're going to talk about these, these laws. Uh, and you can see that deinstitutionalization continued after these laws emerged. Uh, and then, of course, managed care more recently, uh, you know, kind of re reserving a hospital level of care for those who, meet, who have a medical necessity uh, for that, all driving the numbers down, you know, really substantially. Now, you know, all of this sort of met, became part of the civil rights movement. Uh, in the late 60s. Uh, there were institutions that people felt were uh, unattractive, and people even sort of questioned the whole notion that there was such a thing as a mental illness. It uh, was diagnosed pretty loosely in those days. Uh, the instruments for diagnosing serious mental disorder were not terribly reliable. There were court decisions that said you could shoe shoehorn anyone in. Anyone could be diagnosed with a, a mental disorder that then could serve as justification for the person's placement in a hospital. And you had Thomas Zaz and, and others saying, and, and this is not even a, you know, a legitimate condition. Uh, people have the right to be different. Uh, so there were those challenges to what was going on, and there were challenges to the consequences of commitment. That the institutions themselves were so often uh, overcrowded, unsanitary, dangerous, uh, as you know, depicted in, in the media, the popular media, the snake pit with Olivia de Havilland in 1948, uh, depicting a, just a horror show of, of institutions where people would be placed. Uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, uh, Kim Kesey's book in, in the early 60s, later a movie with Jack Nicholson, uh, showing how paternalistic uh, and how easily people could be uh, admitted to facilities. Titicut Follies, Richard Greisman's piece, Francis, and other movies uh, kind of depicting these facilities as pretty horrible places in, in which not much in the way of meaningful treatment was provided. There were lawsuits. In addition to changes in, in the laws regulating the commitment of folks, there were lawsuits uh, challenging states to put up services that were meaningful services that would uh, provide an opportunity for people to recover uh, and to, uh, to win release from the institution. Uh, losses to the rights, 
the stigma of being hospitalized, of being labeled with a psychiatric illness and placed in, a, in an institution. Uh, uh, again, driving, uh, you know, uh, lawyers and, and legislators to consider making this, regulating this process to some degree. And the conclusion basically that, you know, commitment in so many cases could be more harmful than helpful. Uh, so there were these changes. Uh, the medical model for, for commitment, which had been in place for so long, gives way to a legal model. Uh, legal procedures, legal standards uh, that have to be met before a person can be committed. Uh, commitment's not just about selecting people who have a need for treatment. That's ultimately what it's about, but it's not just that. We also have to be concerned about the liberty interests at stake. Uh, and, uh, you know, the goal here is to prevent the kinds of abuses we've seen in the past by narrowing the circumstances that would justify commitment and disciplining the commitment process. So we have substantive and procedural due process considerations, the standard for commitment that warrants the person's placement and procedures that make uh, the process fair. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court in 1975 in the O'Connor versus Donaldson case uh, made the point that, you know, really I think that the, the case can be read for the proposition that one must be dangerous uh, in some sense in order to be subject to an involuntary commitment. Now, the language of the opinion suggested uh, you can't commit without more a person who's not dangerous. And some people have read that to say, well, so long as you provide treatment, you can commit someone who's not dangerous. But, you know, there's language in the opinion, if you read it closely, in subsequent opinions, really that suggests that some kind of risk of harm must be there uh, in order for the state to justify taking a person's liberty and placing them against their will in an institution for treatment. So again, you know, states uh, glommed on to this uh, and changed their laws. And by the mid-70s, by the late 70s, uh, pretty much every state uh, had a law that required dangerousness or something like dangerousness uh, together with the need for treatment uh, as a standard for commitment. At the same time, procedural reform, uh, instead of just, you know, having family members bring the person to an institution and being admitted on a fine that they would, uh, you know, have some benefit, we now have, you know, the right to a hearing, typically before a judge, the right to counsel, to be represented by a lawyer, uh, the right to confront uh, witnesses who would argue for commitment, uh, and a standard of proof that would require that the state prove that this person meets the commitment standard by clear and convincing evidence. Uh, some states early on required proof beyond a reasonable doubt, same standard that we use in criminal cases uh, for someone to be convicted of a crime. Uh, a number of states uh, early uh, when they wrote these laws in the 70s required the state proof committability beyond a reasonable doubt. But the U.S. Supreme Court in 1978 said, you don't have to go that far. It's, it's kind of maybe not realistic that you can diagnose someone with a serious mental disorder uh, and assess that they are at this degree of risk uh, with that degree of precision. Uh, and they said, you know, clear and convincing evidence uh, is, is adequate constitutionally uh, for determining that someone meets the standard for commitment. Shouldn't be quantified, but if it were, maybe somewhere around 75% certainty that the person uh, has poses some risk of harm because of the mental disorder and uh, would be a good candidate for replacement for treatment. Uh, standards for commitment have evolved. Initially, uh, in the 70s, they were really very strict. Uh, imminent risk of serious bodily harm is evidenced by recent overt acts of violence, proved, uh, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt uh, in some states. Uh, there was retrenchment even by the early 1980s. States have begun to soften their stance here. Uh, and even if they left this language as part of the statute, uh, the practices weren't quite so rigid. So the elements that we've got currently uh, in commitment law, uh, in every state, every state's law is different. You know, the states uh, control these laws and, and write their own laws, and but they have uh, elements in common. Uh, everyone uh, refers to, you know, folks with a mental illness. You know, the person must have a mental illness to be a candidate for commitment. Uh, it must be dangerous in some sense, or maybe, uh, certainly this is one of the uh, criteria that, that most states uh, will use. Dangerousness to others, dangerousness to self, or grave disability. I'm going to talk about each of these in a little more detail in a minute. Just want to kind of put them up here uh, to introduce them. Uh, need for treatment, the essential standard for commitment uh, required in, in, in every state. Uh, in a few states, incompetence to make a treatment choice. The person lacks insight, may be incompetent to choose. Serious deterioration, the standard that's used for outpatient commitment. You'll hear more about this from Jeff. 
uh, also finding its way into inpatient commitment law and justifying uh, hospitalization in some states. Uh, and then this notion that whatever we do, any kind of commitment we impose, must reflect the, the least restrictive alternative. It must be to a setting that's least restrictive of the person's liberty, consistent with their needs uh, and public safety. So these are the elements. Now, mental illness, again, required uh, really in every state, and it's always defined in terms of very serious mental illness, typically not including substance use, substance abuse, although a few states do recognize substance uh, abuse as, as a, a, you know, a qualifying condition for civil commitment. Some states have a separate sort of parallel system for commitment for folks with substance use issues. Uh, intellectual disabilities, again, usually uh, states you know, have other procedures, other laws that for, for the placement of those folks. Uh, uh, personality disorders, again, they don't really fit here because we're talking about committing folks who have a need for a hospital level of psychiatric care. So the target here uh, is serious mental disorder. Dangerousness to others. Now, this is part of the law in really pretty much every state. Uh, includes this as one of the criterion for commitment due to a mental illness. And that's important to recognize. I think a lot of people lose sight of the fact that dangerousness is not just that the person's out, you know, it's high risk for violent behavior. It's dangerousness at some risk of harm due to a mental illness. Uh, it's, uh, it's not defined in many states. A lot of states simply the statute says, you know, dangerous to self or others, and that the person can be committed. Uh, in many states, though, the law still speaks in terms of bodily harm. The person poses some risk of doing bodily harm to, to others uh, in the uh, near future, that it's an imminent risk, uh, and that there's, a, you know, a recent overt act or threat that demonstrates the person's dangerousness. But uh, increasingly, you don't see that as much uh, in the statutes. Uh, and even where you do, it's not followed very strictly uh, as a practical matter. The person's at, at some significant risk for harm uh, and even emotional harm, some states say. Iowa, by statute, says that the person's at risk for inflicting emotional harm on the other members of the family. That's dangerousness to others. Uh, harm to others' property. Uh, included in the statutory language in many states, uh, and in practice in others. So it's not quite as strict as I think a lot of people have understood. Uh, we're not really talking necessarily about someone's likelihood of com committing a violent act on another person. Dangerousness to self, uh, not defined in many states. Uh, in some states, it's defined uh, in terms of the likelihood the person's going to hurt oneself, active dangerousness, the person's suicidal, likely to injure self. Uh, and then there's this notion of passive dangerousness, the person's, uh, you know, unable to care for self and is dangerous to self that way, uh, is unable to care for their essential needs, food, clothing, shelter, uh, and the rest because of their illness, uh, and that places them at risk of harm to self passively. Uh, you know, this is kind of what dangerous to self is all about and probably is the more common uh, you know, venue or avenue uh, uh, to commitment for folks with serious mental illnesses. Uh, on dangerousness, and, and you know, everyone seems to think dangerousness is the primary consideration uh, at commitment. The, you know, the question ultimately is, you know, what's the risk here? What's the degree of risk? What's the harm that the person's at risk for? How soon is the uh, the person likely to uh, present this uh, this risk? Uh, and, you know, all of these are questions that arguably are clinical, uh, and experts, mental health professionals, psychiatrists so often are asked to do an evaluation and give an opinion to a court that will make the ultimate determination whether the person's committable, uh, and the clinician can talk about uh, what risks this person presents, risk of, you know, behaving in a certain way. Uh, there's a certain degree of risk this person's going to behave this way uh, in some period of time, but whether the degree of risk, uh, the person's, you know, the, the behavior the person's at risk for justifies their commitment, makes them legally dangerous, is a social values question, ultimately for the court to resolve. I mean, the court so often is going to look to the expert for the opinion uh, or for the answer to the question, is this person dangerous? Is this person committable? But it's important that clinicians recognize that their role is to assess the risk and describe it so the court can understand what risks this person presents and can weigh those in making the, the determination whether under these circumstances commitment is justified. Okay, need for treatment. Again, the essential commitment standard, uh, that's what this is ultimately all about, selecting people who require uh, an, an inpatient uh, hospital level of care. Um, most states' statutes make it clear, you know, that this is an element, this is a criterion for commitment. In many states, it's simply part of the definition of mental illness. 
Uh, dangerousness, again, you know, uh, is intended to limit the scope of commitment, not to expand it to include dangerous people who don't need treatment, commitments only for people who need treatment and whose need for treatment is so great that they present some kind of risk of harm uh, that uh, gets our attention. Uh, incompetence uh, required in a few states by statute uh, in more states years ago uh, that the person would have to be incompetent to make a choice uh, to, to admit oneself uh, in order to be uh, committed. Uh, it's not included in the laws in many states, but you, you do find it in some states. Uh, there was the Stone Roth uh, thank you theory proposed in the late 70s. Uh, Lauren Roth and Alan Stone presented sort of a model law for civil commitment that turned on considerations of competence. Uh, would require that the person be diagnosed uh, with a serious mental illness, a reliable diagnosis of a serious mental illness, the prognosis is not good, and the person lacks insight, is incompetent to choose to go in. Uh, appropriate treatment is available and is likely to make a difference, is likely actually to help. And the person, if they were thinking clearly, would recognize the risk-benefit ratio was such that they would consent. Uh, the treatment would be brief. At that time, Florin Roth for six weeks as a brief commitment, uh, because at that time, six weeks was a very brief commitment. Uh, but the, the idea was we would do this, the person would respond, and after treatment, they would say, thank you, I needed that. Uh, it was an, an interesting approach, an interesting proposal, uh, you know, for a commitment law, but it didn't really uh, get traction, didn't really go anywhere, although some of its elements are popular today, and they're finding their way uh, uh, into commitment laws, we'll see. Um, serious deterioration, uh, I mentioned before, this is language that uh, first made its way into the law for outpatient civil commitment, for folks who didn't require a, a hospital level of care, but who suffered from a deterioration that uh, might make them uh, in need of hospitalization down the road. Uh, substantial probability is demonstrated both by the individual's treatment history and by recent acts of or omissions that the individual needs care or treatment to prevent further disability or deterioration that would lead to the person becoming dangerous, essentially, becoming committable uh, to a facility. Uh, now this language has found its way into the inpatient commitment laws in some states. This is Wisconsin for commitment to a facility. This is the one of the criteria that uh, can, uh, can qualify for inpatient commitment in Wisconsin and a few other states. Uh, Oregon has a similar language. Uh, so, you know, the law is evolving. Uh, and it's beginning to recognize there are a lot of folks who may not be eminently at high risk for violent behavior, but who nonetheless require hospitalization because they're deteriorating and their condition uh, is going to place them at that kind of risk of harm down the road. Uh, is dangerousness even necessary anymore? I mean, if we're committing folks who uh, are deteriorating, we're concerned about their risks uh, in the future, are we even requiring that a person be dangerous in order to be subject to an involuntary hospitalization. Uh, if you look at the case law, it sure suggests dangerousness is necessary. A number of Supreme Court decisions where they just refer to it as naturally uh, you know, a requirement for commitment. Uh, but, you know, it's a practical matter. If you look back at Wisconsin's law, uh, this is speaking in terms of the person's deterioration that may lead in the future to risk uh, that the person will you know, be at harm. The question becomes, you know, is that enough? Uh, is that dangerousness? And I think I could make the argument that yes, someone who is deteriorating, who's suffering a, a, a you know a, an increased disability that predictably is going to result in them being at risk for, for example, violent behavior or any kind of other harm, grave disability, you know, is dangerous. Uh, that you know this is all just a matter of when. It's a question of how imminent the risk is. But the person is at risk of harm, and that's ultimately the, the concern here. Uh, least restrictive alternative, I mentioned this before, uh, this is required, the, the courts have made this clear pretty much across the country, that if there's a least restrictive setting in which the person may be served, then we can't justify hospital, hospital level care. Uh, you know, if the person can be served in the community, maybe subject to a commitment, but not in the institution, perhaps to outpatient commitment, suggesting that's an, an, an alternate approach for dealing with people who may need uh, you know, the force of law behind their placement, but who don't need a hospital level of care. Uh, Jeff's going to talk much more about that in a few minutes. Just a word about commitment procedures these days, the way it's done, and most of you who have involvement with this know that this is kind of what happens, but uh, in, in every state, there are a variety of folks who may petition for someone's commitment, typically family members, 
others. Uh, so often, commitment is initiated by the police. There's a crisis, the police are called, the crisis response team uh, re responds, and uh, the police may assume custody of the individual, take the individual to a facility for treatment uh, and for evaluation. Uh, a mental health professional who's treating someone may uh, write certs in many states, certifications uh, that justify, that have the force of law for the person to be taken into custody, taken to a facility for further evaluation. Uh, so there's this period of initial hospitalization that may be entirely medical, often even without a court's involvement, that can last anywhere from a day or two up to, uh, in New York, 60 days without any court review. Uh, and during this period, uh, the person uh, is going to be admitted for evaluation primarily, but it's going to be offered the opportunity for treatment. Uh, and uh, in so many cases, people avail themselves of the opportunity to receive treatment while they're in this uh, initial hold. Uh, others may respond quickly, may be uh, suitable for release, perhaps connected with services in the community without the need for going deeper uh, into the commitment process. Uh, and so this is kind of an, uh, an important portal, you know, within the continuum of care uh, for folks who have mental disorders and who have experienced a crisis and may be brought uh, into a facility by way of, you know, the uh, involuntary commitment process, but then uh, may be triaged from there into services in, in other settings. But if they remain within the, you know, the commitment process, the next stage in the process, of course, the hearing for a judicial officer, a judge, or someone else who's authorized to, to, to act as a judge, there's the right to a lawyer, there's the right, again, to proof by clear and convincing evidence, the state has to, to make the showing that this is someone who meets the standard for commitment by clear and convincing evidence. And then there's review. Uh, the person's going to be committed. It's an indeterminate commitment, but it's going to be subject to periodic review, uh, and the court may have to recommit anywhere from a period of 15 days up to typically six months uh, or so uh, before the court has to look again. Uh, it's rare, though, that someone would be committed for as long as six months anymore these days. Most commitments last no longer than a week or 10 days. Uh, but that's the process by law. Now, it's become quite legalized uh, in the last, what, 60 years, 50 years. Uh, but it's interesting. There's been research. Uh, Paul Applebaum has a wonderful book, Almost a Revolution, published in 1994, in which he looks at whether the law, how much difference these laws actually made in commitment rates. Uh, and he concluded, based on looking at the studies that were done, that, you know, there was uh, an initial dip uh, in commitments when these laws first appeared in the, in the mid-'70s. But, you know, it was brief. Uh, and that by you know, the late 70s, already we're seeing, you know, commitment rates return to about the same place they were before. Uh, you know, it, uh, it was researched on looking at uh, what really goes on in these commitments. I was involved in a study of the MacArthur Foundation funded 1980-1981, and we went into uh, 10 states and looked at, uh, at commitment hearings. And what we interviewed the attorneys who represented uh, these folks at the commitment hearings, and we asked them what they saw as their role. Uh, and almost all of them said, the best interests of my client, not necessarily advocating for their expressed wishes, but for what, was, what, what they needed. If someone were in a crisis, presented, hospitalized, so often the attorneys wouldn't really fight very hard for the person's release. And as a consequence, you know, commitment rates didn't change very much. What changed, though, is the length of stay. It used to be people would be committed for years and often for life. Uh, today, the length of stay, again, seven to 10 days for most individuals who are civilly committed. But, uh, you know, they're released, and they're not always adequately supported in the community. Readmission is not uncommon. Uh, and so we have lots of commitments, lots of folks who cycle in and out and in and out, uh, but not very many in at any given time because the lengths of stay are so brief. Uh, there's plenty of research showing, that, of course, you know, one of the reasons folks don't do well when they're released is that so much more than just mental health care is needed. And Jeff will talk about this and the opportunity, uh, you know, in some states with outpatient commitment laws to leverage not only psychiatric care but other services, housing, uh, other services that help people uh, make it uh, when they're released from the hospital. So critically important, uh, uh, you know, for folks who go through this process. Just a word about special populations. Kids, it's a little different. The law is different for kids. Uh, the law, pretty much, or at least the Supreme Court, has recognized that parents have a lot of authority when it comes to the treatment of their children. They can simply check their kids in. Now, a lot of states have laws that regulate that, uh, maybe only allow the parents to offer up or authorize a, an admission for a couple of weeks or something. The law re would require 
you know, more due process. But the point is here, constitutionally, uh, we, we're look, it's a very different process when we're talking about kids. Um, other special populations, correctional inmates, people who are in prison, the U.S. Supreme Court has said, you know, the fact that you've been, um, you know, sentenced to time in prison doesn't extinguish all of your liberty rights. I mean, certainly you're locked up, but you still have the right not to be subject to involuntary treatment. So you are due some level of due process, but not the level of due process we've been talking about that kicks in for ordinary uh, civil commitment. Lots of states have laws that look pretty similar to their ordinary civil commitment laws that are used uh, for the commitment of folks from prison, but they're not constitutionally necessary. Uh, you don't even have to have a judge uh, as, uh, you know, a presiding officer at a hearing. It has to be some sort of hearing. There has to be some sort of assistance for the individual, but not necessarily even a lawyer at the commitment hearing, and there doesn't have to be a showing the person presents a risk of harm. Uh, simply that they need treatment in a psychiatric hospital constitutionally probably will suffice. I think a lot of people aren't aware of that, but that's what the court has said. Uh, as a practical matter, most states do have stricter measures in place for the commitment of folks from corrections, but um, but it's different constitutionally, at least. It can be different uh, in that setting. Uh, and then uh, civil commitment, some states, 20 states, have uh, laws for the special civil commitment of sexually dangerous persons, uh, individuals who've been uh, convicted of a sex crime, have done their time, were about to be released from prison, and now are subject to a special civil commitment uh, for treatment. Uh, on a finding that they have a mental abnormality or a personality disorder that makes them sexually dangerous. We've been talking about how commitment is reserved for people who have a need for treatment. You know, I would argue that some of these uh, laws are sometimes used not so much out of concern for the person's need for treatment uh, as, uh, you know, concerns for public safety. Uh, someone uh, we don't want to release from prison who's done their time now in prison and would otherwise be released uh, if we find that they have a mental abnormality or personality disorder that makes them sexually dangerous. We can justify their placement uh, under a civil commitment because, after all, civil commitments are that dangerous, you know, dangerousness. If a person's dangerous, then we can commit. Uh, and it's sort of a dangerous development, I think, uh, in that it, it, it sort of suggests that, you know, commitment is not for purposes of treatment. It's for purposes of public safety. And I don't believe civil commitment ever should be seen that way. Uh, the ABA, uh, or the a APA, I get the ABA, the American Psychiatric Association, uh, looked at these laws some years ago and said uh, they distort the traditional meaning of civil commitment, misallocate psychiatric facilities and resources, and constitute an abuse of psychiatry. This is not how we should be using civil commitment. Civil commitment is about you know, selecting people who have a, a need for a hospital-level psychiatric care. Uh, and these, uh, these laws aren't necessarily uh, designed that way. Ah, and I am done with my intro to inpatient commitment. I think at this point we're going to hand it over to Jeff, and we'll hear some about, uh, about outpatient commitment laws. Well, thank you, Larry. And uh, I'd also like to thank uh, SAMHSA and Nashman for the opportunity to speak to you all today about civil commitment and the mental health care uh, continuum. Um, and let me just see here if I can, yeah. Um, so now we turn to a discussion of outpatient commitment, and that's sometimes called mandated community treatment or a community treatment order. Uh, most commonly in the United States, you'll hear the term assisted outpatient treatment, which is kind of a euphemism. But as a legal intervention, outpatient commitment it derives essentially from the same civil commitment authority that Larry has been describing for involuntary hospitalization. It, it, that's to say that it's an exercise of the state's uh, parents' patria authority to take care of people who uh, need treatment uh, to mitigate risk of, of harm or uh, risk of future harm associated with mental illness who otherwise aren't going to get it, uh, aren't going to get the treatment. But it, it is, is an extension of that authority uh, from the uh, institutional hospital setting out into the community as a less restrictive uh, alternative. Uh, where did it come from? Outpatient commitment uh, really emerged in the 1980s, uh, pretty much after the first wave of deinstitutionalization, if you remember that uh, sort of ski slope looking graph that Larry presented. Um, after you sort of, you're starting to get down to where the chalet is. Uh, and, and it was essentially at a time too in the, in the 80s when, uh, when uh, there was essentially a defunding of the community uh, mental health centers during the Reagan administration. And, uh, 
And so the architects of outpatient commitment as a policy uh, saw this as a solution to a, to a particular problem that was emerging. And, they, and the problem they referred to was the revolving door syndrome. So you have a group of adults, maybe not, a, uh, not a, a large percentage of people with serious mental illnesses, but there was a group with serious and pre-disabling uh, conditions like schizophrenia. In the 1950s, they would have been in the hospital for long periods of time. But now they're in the community, and they're not doing very well. Um, yes, there are psychotropic medications that are recommended for treating these conditions, um, but uh, people aren't necessarily taking them. And maybe they're not able to or not willing to for reasons having to do with the kinds of barriers in the community and the lack of uh, support. And um, so they're not taking medicine consistently. And what happens is the symptoms get worse, they deteriorate, then they get to the point where they meet the inpatient commitment criteria, they come back to the hospital. They're in the hospital for a very brief stay, they go back into the community, and uh, then they come back to the hospital after, after deteriorating and, and on and on. Um, and, you know, maybe they go to jail for a while. That's a, as another uh, sort of crisis destination. And, you know, in some of our studies here in North Carolina, we've enrolled psychiatric patients who have had a history of literally dozens of hospital uh, admissions over a period of years. So the logic of outpatient commitment is to say, well, let's try to break that cycle, use a legal tool to uh, mandate that, uh, that, that people consistently engage in treatment to the point where they can recover, they can exercise their own autonomous judgment with the hope that they'll then remain in treatment and basically be able to act in their, in their best interest. Um, so, um, and, it, and it began really as a kind of conditional release where people started in the hospital and then they were released uh, still under that sort of inpatient commitment uh, and, but could be brought back uh, to the hospital. So uh, outpatient commitment is a civil court order, and it just applies to certain kinds of people and certain criteria. Uh, sometimes uh, the advocates for outpatient commitment talk about it as also committing the system to the patient. So there's this kind of dual bond. One is a lever on the compliance or adherence behavior of the patient, and the other is to create this accountability to the system of care to pay attention to a particular person and engage in the appropriate outreach to make sure that they are able to avail themselves of treatment. I like to think of it as a treatment plan wrapped in a legal order. So the treatment plan, the outpatient commitment order, is kind of an empty vessel. What matters is what's inside of it in the treatment plan. And the services under AOT, which I'll use as a, uh, you know, a, a abbreviation for assisted outpatient treatment, t typically the core of it is intensive case management uh, or it's like being on an assertive community treatment team. And so that you have this case manager who kind of can broker access to these other services that people need, treatment, typically medication, psychosocial treatment, and often uh, something like access to subsidized housing so people can be stably housed and they can, and they can uh, be able to avail themselves of treatment and to, and to recover. Now, this is not like other court orders where, you know, some, it can be a criminal offense to violate a court order. This is a little different. The only sanction for it, really, if somebody uh, decides not to follow the plan, is that the person can be picked up and transported to a mental health care facility to be evaluated, maybe persuaded to take the medicine or the treatment, um, and to see if they meet the criteria for involuntary hospitalization if needed. But, it, but again, if they don't, and they uh, aren't committable, and they uh, don't want to participate in the treatment. There's not really much uh, in the way of teeth in a, in a uh, law like this. Now, whether somebody believes that they are legally required to follow the treatment plan is a different matter. Sometimes that's what motivates people, even though they're unaware that, you know, really legally they couldn't be strapped down and, you know, uh, forcibly injected uh, simply under the order of an outpatient treatment order. Um, so there, there are different types of outpatient commitment. I mentioned conditional release, um, which is available in 40 states. Uh, sometimes it's a trial visit. It's a visit to discharge. It's sort of the tail end of an involuntary inpatient commitment. Sometimes there's a, a discretion given by the judge to the doctor as to when the inpatient part of it stops and when the outpatient part st uh, starts. Uh, but again, the person could be brought back to the hospital under conditional, re conditional release without an, uh, an additional commitment hearing. The second type, you know, I'd call alternatives to hospitalization for people who actually are committable under the state's inpatient commitment criteria, and that's 16 states have that. Now, typically, uh, that uh, type of outpatient commitment, and Paul Applebaum has uh, observed this in print, 
it didn't get much use or much traction. Why is that? Well, if, you know, think about it from a psychiatrist's point of view. If you've gone to the trouble of testifying and determining that someone is dangerous enough to be in the hospital, and then you turn around and say, okay, but we're going to let that person out into the community, you know, maybe a risk-averse uh, psychiatrist might not want to do that. So the third type is, you know, we could call preventive outpatient commitment. And then 35 states, as you see, have that. What that is is that it, it authorizes the outpatient commitment order at a lower threshold uh, than, than inpatient commitment criteria. So somebody doesn't have to be dangerous right now, but they, they have to have a pattern of illness, a pattern of, of uh, use of services, prior hospitalizations that would indicate that without uh, treatment, they're going to deteriorate to the point where they will become dangerous. They will uh, pose a harm to others yourself. And without this court supervision, they're unlikely to get treatment as a, as a feature of their illness that makes them sort of unable or unwilling to participate in treatment and act in their own best interest. And then four states, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Maryland, and New Mexico, don't have outpatient commitment. They're basically opposed to it, uh, you know, for uh, sort of some ideological reasons. Um, so uh, the, the criteria, North Carolina has a very typical um, uh, preventive outpatient commitment statute. Uh, you have to have a serious mental illness, so there's a diagnostic uh, element to it. You have to have the capacity to survive in the community with available support. So you don't want somebody to be on outpatient commitment if they really can't make it in the, in the community. Uh, and there has to be, as I mentioned, this clinical history that indicates a need for treatment to prevent deterioration that would predictably result in dangerousness. This mental status that limits or negates, this is the language of North Carolina, the individual's ability to make informed decisions to seek or comply with, uh, with recommended treatment. So that's, that's a sort of a, sort of an incapacity prong there, uh, the, the, the fourth one. A little, a little bit uh, goes to the person's ability to make decisions, their decisional competence. So um, just in passing, let me say, uh, maybe state the obvious, not everybody likes outpatient treatment. Some people really don't like it, and some people really do. And you know, I've heard it described sometimes as a, a sort of a civil war in the, uh, in the community of mental health stakeholders around this axis of uh, sort of paternalism versus autonomy and uh, how we think about the individual with mental illness. So, uh, you know, representative of the, of the kind of uh, uh, proponent, strong proponent of outpatient commitment would be uh, E. Fuller Torrey, who was a very strong advocate of it and founded the Treatment Advocacy Center. And, you know, if you've heard Dr. Torrey speak about this, he really he talks about it in terms of of uh, trying to do the humane thing. And we'll give the example, you know, we wouldn't allow our, our grandparents with Alzheimer's disease to wander around the community uh, with no intervention simply because they say they don't want it. No, that would be inhumane. So why do we allow, you know, young adults with schizophrenia who can't uh, take care of themselves uh, to, do, to, to be out there with no treatment? And so, you know, uh, uh, Fulatori's view was that we needed to roll back some of these strict criteria for civil commitment, make it easier to intervene, to override people's right to refuse treatment when they are presumably, uh, you know, don't have the insight into their need for treatment. So he says mandatory treatment for those too ill to recognize they need help is far more humane than our present mandatory non-treatment, which is kind of a hyperbole for the situation that we have here. Uh, and then on the other side, you know, represented by, say, the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law, is the is the more uh, libertarian view, and you know if you think about that uh, position from the uh, say the, the the position of someone who might have a mental illness, you know, might say, well, I have a bipolar disorder, and, and maybe I need treatment, but that should be up to me. We live in a society where we cherish the ability of people to make their own decisions, uh, including decisions about their own uh, treatment, their own healthcare treatment, or refusing treatment. And yes, we might acknowledge there is a problem with the access to services and people aren't getting treatment they need, but that's a service system problem. It's not a legal problem. And outpatient commitment is not to the quick fix that can overcome these inadequacies. In fact, it kind of distracts us from the reforms that we need to make with these systems that are fragmented and overburdened and, and uh, you know, under-resourced. And coercion is not the answer to that, even with judicial sanctions. That's the view. There, you know, if you say, "Hey, I'm not. Uh, I'm right now. I have mental illness, but I am not imminently dangerous right now. I am not uh, mentally incapacitated, and I am certainly not criminally accused. So, on what basis is the state going to override my right to refuse treatment and, and force me into treatment?" Now, the the, the the fact is that that situation it, it does not really map onto the 
modal uh, pathway for getting outpatient commitment, which is someone is in the hospital already under involuntary uh, inpatient commitment, and then they step down into the community. It, it, it's uh, far less common someone is in the community in, the, in that sort of liberty situation, and then this is imposed on top of them. Um, so the American Psychiatric Association, as well as other organizations like NAMI, have the position statements about this. I'll just mention quickly the key points. Uh, you know, if you ask the APA, the uh, architects of, or the authors of this, are you for outpatient commitment or against it? Is it good or bad? They probably have to say, well, it depends, because there's an if there. Involuntary outpatient commitment if it is systematically implemented, and if its resource can be a useful tool to promote recovery through a program of, of intensive outpatient services. So, and it's designed uh, for certain things. It's supposed to improve treatment adherence. It's supposed to reduce relapse and rehospitalization. Uh, notice these are kind of system outcomes. We care about, you know, use of hospitals and, and de decrease the likelihood of dangerous behavior, although that one is, you know, uh, arguable as well. And it's a subpopulation, it's a small population of people with severe mental illness. It's not everybody. And so it's, it has to be carefully targeted. Um, and the goal of outpatient commitment also is to mobilize treatment resources. Uh, now, you know, that again, you know, could be a controversial idea if, the, if all we're trying to do is mobilize resources, why do we need to put a person under an order, court order to do that? Uh, but if that's the goal and this accomplishes it, well, you know, the APA says that that is, that that is a good goal. And it's supposed to enhance the effectiveness and improve a person's adherence to the plan so that over time, you know, a person's long-term autonomy could be improved by, uh, by abridging that in the short term. And it, but it shouldn't be used uh, as a primary tool to prevent acts of violence. That's an interesting statement because, you know, as a, as a, as a practical matter, uh, concerns about violence and mental illness are, are, are a key to how a number of outpatient commitment statutes have gotten enacted. You know, and uh, there's it's no accident that several of these statutes, like Kendra's Law in New York and Laura's Law in California and uh, uh, Kevin's Law in Michigan are named after people who died, uh, you know, in, in homicides perpetrated by people who uh, sensibly had untreated mental illness because people care about public safety and this has been a way to mobilize interest in these laws. Um, so the APA says, though, that, the, that um, it's, it's most effective when there is a, it talks about the treatment, a range of medication management, psychosocial services, that are uh, provided in an intensive way. And assertive community treatment is, is sort of the, that's kind of the model for the treatment that should be available under uh, patient commitment. And in fact, it is a very common assignment for people in, in uh, places like New York that have assisted outpatient treatment. Um, and that, you know, again, to re reiterate, if states want to do this, they should make sure that there are adequate resources available to provide the treatment that is in that, uh, that, is in that legal order doesn't make any sense and it wouldn't be fair to order somebody to participate in treatment that's not available. Uh, a study was done uh, in 2016, sort of a survey of, the, of all the state's uh, outpatient commitment programs by uh, uh, Meldrum and colleagues, and they, they uh, determined that 20 states had active programs of outpatient commitment. So a lot of states have these statutes in place that really aren't using them very much. And most of these 20 states that have active programs do have some form of the, uh, of the preventive outpatient commitment statute that uh, does not require imminent dangerousness, that has a lower threshold than the inpatient commitment criteria, and would allow uh, uh, an order based on what is expected to happen in the future. There's this kind of nested prediction that we don't think you're going to get treatment without the court order. And if you don't get treatment, you will deteriorate. And if you deteriorate, you will become dangerous. And that's the sort of the logic of it. Now, whether we have the science to make those predictions in a reliable and valid way is a different, a different question. Uh, how common is outpatient commitment? Well, I was part of a uh, study uh, sponsored by the MacArthur Research Network on mandated community treatment some years ago. And, and we uh, studied uh, five uh, populations, five different states of uh, outpatients in public systems of care and ask them if they've been on outpatient commitment, describing what it was. And across the states, um, 12 to 20 percent of those individuals indicated that they had had uh, some form of outpatient commitment. A larger proportion uh, indicated they'd had some kind of what we call leveraged outpatient commitment or treatment, which is to say uh, 
uh, and it might be in the civil legal system or the criminal justice system or the social welfare system. So, for example, you know, I'm uh, I'm your representative payee for your uh, S for your SSI, and I, I'm not going to give you your spending money unless you go to the mental health center and take your medicine. Or uh, I'm your landlord, and as a condition of your lease, you can't live here unless you go to the mental health center and get your treatment. Or I'm your probation officer, and this is a condition of your probation. If you don't participate in treatment, you're going to go back to jail. So these kinds of uh, leveraged or, uh, contingencies linked to treatment participation are quite common, actually, in people who are in the public system of care in, 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 in a variety of states that we've studied. So does outpatient commitment work? Does it work, yes or no? Well, you know, again, like, like, the, like the answer to so many complicated questions, the right answer to that is it depends. It depends on what we mean by outpatient commitment. As I've mentioned, there are different types of it. And, you know, maybe uh, outpatient commitment that has a very high bar for qualifying for it, that might not work very well. or um, you know, And what do we mean by work? What kind of work is outpatient commitment supposed to do? Is it supposed to just keep people out of the hospital, or is it supposed to really provide a benefit to people that matters to them, you know, in their terms of their quality of life and, and uh, you know, the goals uh, that we have uh, for ourselves? But does it work compared to what? Um, you know, compared to no treatment at all? Compared to voluntary treatment? Uh, are, we, and, and are we comparing people before and after outpatient commitment or to other populations? And who does it work for? Who is the population that really needs this and uh, what are, you know, versus populations where it might not work at all. Does it work where? It might work in New York City. It might not work in a, in a very rural area where services are less accessible uh, or maybe in a different country. Um, and then, you know, uh, how? Uh, does it work and for how long? Does, why does somebody need to be on outpatient commitment indefinitely? Uh, or is it more like, you know, putting a cast on your arm to let your arm heal and you take the cast off? You know, or is it more like a you know prosthetic device that some people are going to need to get to be able to get treatment uh, indefinitely? And then you know, if if we determine it does work, well, does that mean we should do it? And so what? Maybe not. Maybe there are other uh, you know uh, considerations like cost. So the if you look across the research on outpatient commitment, there've been uh, at least three randomized trials. One of was ours in North Carolina where. We got the district court judges to allow us to randomly assign people coming out of the hospital either to a voluntary case manager or case manager without patient commitment. We follow people over the uh, year and looked at their hospitalizations and other outcomes. And, and um, you know, we, we think that we found uh, a significant benefit for outpatient commitment, although some of the results there are contested because we couldn't randomize how long a period of outpatient commitment a person received. Uh, that depended on whether it got renewed or not. Then there was the Bellevue study uh, in, in uh, New York City, and then there was a replication of our study, ostensibly in the UK by Tom Burns and his colleagues. It wasn't quite like ours because the comparison group really were people under a, a form of uh, conditional release. Um, and uh, they, they, they basically reported negative results or, or null results, that there wasn't any benefit for outpatient commitment. The largest study was uh, a very, uh, you know, big legislatively mandated study in New York of the AOT program there, a quasi-experimental evaluation where we had Medicaid data and all kinds of things. And, um, you know, that uh, you know, we published a series of papers from our group. Uh, the evidence reviews, uh, there have been several of them, uh, the RAND study, the UK report, Rachel Churchill and colleagues, and the Co Cochrane Collaborative by Steve Kaisley and others. Um, you know, basically, I think what, what we would um, uh, conclude in big picture is that the results are mixed, but there is success, and it is conditioned, conditioned on investment in effective implementation. And it is, uh, it's conditioned on having the availability of intensive community-based services and how long the court order lasts and, um, and whether you're looking at sort of service system outcomes or individual outcomes, that makes a, a bit of a difference as well. Um, so just to give you an example here, this bar graph is a paper we published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. If you look at the circled area there, what we're displaying there is the average cost per person during the year before, the year during, and the year after uh, they were placed on assisted outpatient treatment. And as you can see there, uh, going from the red bar to the orange bar, uh, being on outpatient commitment basically tripled the cost per person of outpatient mental health treatment. So you might think, well, that's going to cost more money to do outpatient treatment. 
uh, patient commitment. But look at this circle here. Now, what this is, is, uh, is focusing on is inpatient care, hospitalization costs, both Medicaid and state hospital admissions. And you can see there that it's just the opposite. The cost for, out, for inpatient uh, treatment went way down from about $50,000 uh, dollars per person down to 11,000 during the year on outpatient commitment, and importantly, it stayed down. Now, there's not necessarily a, a straight transfer of money for a save from uh, not admitting people to the hospital into out, you know, outpatient care, but you know, uh, overall, if you think about it, there, there's the possibility for a big cost offset there. So, what about the question of whether uh, outpatient commitment is ethical, and how do we decide that? Uh, well, one way to do that is to think about some principles that bioethicists have agreed on or are important ways to consider a policy uh, or an intervention. Uh, and uh, and the, the four principles made famous in this book by uh, Beecham and Childress are non-maleficence. Does it harm people? We don't want to harm people. Uh, beneficence. Does, do we actually benefit people in ways that matter to them? Does it promote what's, what's good? And does it respect people's autonomy? Um, you know, not necessarily um, whether people make a good decision, but it's their decision. And uh, allowing them, you know, people to be the uh, authors of their own lives, to write their own life story. And what about justice, fairness, distribution of burdens and benefits and risks? Um, well, so those are, those are important questions. The answers to them are, are uh, not necessarily straightforward. Uh, but I think some research that we have done uh, and reported in the literature helps us kind of think through some of these things. One is to ask the question, well, what do AOT recipients think themselves of AOT? And this sort of gets to what Larry referred to as the uh, Lauren Roth thank you theory. You know, at the end of the day, if people have outpatient commitment and you ask them, was this good? Not just for, you know, people in general, but for you. Did you do you think this is, uh, should have been done? And and, and, and we can measure people's subjective quality of life, not just whether they stayed out of the hospital. Uh, we can ask uh, whether, you know, uh, if, if there are two things that people want to avoid, one is being in the hospital and one is, you know, being on outpatient commitment, which is more salient, which is more important than, uh, than the other. And is it fair? And what about, you know, uh, even if it is uh, fair and it benefits you, do you, did you feel that you were, that you were coerced, uh, that you were forced uh, to do these things? Well, here's a bar graph that goes to this question of retrospective endorsement. And uh, we asked people who'd been on outpatient commitment at the end of the year uh, whether they thought it was something that provided a personal benefit to them. This is sort of the thank you theory question. And if you look at the whole sample, uh, you know, it's uh, not great news. 27% of the people who had outpatient commitment said that they thought that that provided a good uh, benefit for them and it should have been done. We stratified the sample into people who had positive outcomes and, and negative outcomes, people who they stayed out of the hospital all year. They didn't get arrested. They had a positive or a good score on the global assessment of functioning. You look at those people, now you get up to 45% versus 20% of those who did not have those good outcomes. But even there, you don't get quite even to 50%. So if we're relying on what people themselves say who have a serious mental illness and have been out and out patient commitment, we're not quite going to get there. We're going to need another way societally of justifying this. Um, so, you know, we also measured subjective quality of life. And, uh, you know, we looked at this correlation and you can see uh, that uh, there, there is a correlation between the number of days on outpatient commitment and the subjective quality of life after 12 months, but there's a positive indirect effect. The direct pathway is not significant and probably shouldn't be logically. There's nothing about AOT just per se that should improve people's quality of life. But it, but it did do that by way of increasing people's participation in services, which in turn decreased symptoms, which in turn improved people's uh, subjective quality of life. And we might say, well, that's really good news, uh, except that there's also this. There is a negative indirect pathway as, all, as well by means of increased perceived coercion. So the more days people spent on outpatient commitment, the more uh, uh, coercion they perceived. And the more coercion they perceive, the lower their subjective quality of life. Now, you look at that, it might look like a paradox. How can it be both good and bad? Well, it's, it's, maybe it's not unlike some kind of a, uh, treat, a medicine, let's say, who, that provides a benefit if there's some symptom relief, but also has a side effect that's unpleasant. Then the question is, are you going to take it? Well, maybe what you want to do is balance out the benefit 
and the downside. It, you know, it, does the benefit have a bigger effect size? In this case, it does, statistically speaking. The, the effect size is, you know, almost twice as large for the uh, benefit of it of increasing subjective quality of life. Uh, another thing that you can do, again, is, to, is to sort of a, a formal uh, assessment of preferences and uh, utilities for, uh, for different outcomes. And, and I won't go into how we measured this, but basically we found that people put a lot more stake, a lot more weight in staying out of the hospital as a good thing than, than, than uh, avoiding outpatient commitment, which, has a, uh, which, which didn't bother them as much, something that mattered uh, less than staying out of the hospital. Um, what about the fairness question? And we can ask that different ways. One is, uh, you know, thinking about it in terms of racial equities. And, um, you know, uh, while we were doing our study in New York, uh, sort of towards the end of it, uh, this report was released by the New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, uh, you know, very unfavorably uh, portraying uh, assisted outpatient treatment in New York as, a, as a, a racially discriminatory racist policy. Why? Because if you look just at the state population, the chance of somebody getting on AOT in New York is about seven times greater if uh, the person is black than if they're white. Uh, and so they, you know, basically alleged that that showed it was racially discriminatory. And, you know, so, uh, and I'll mention in a minute how we looked at that. Another question about fairness is queue jumping. If you think about, you know, uh, a, con a constrained system where, where something like uh, an assertive community treatment team is a very scarce resource and you have people figuratively standing in line voluntarily who want these services can't get them. And then here comes somebody with a court order to the front of the line, you know, and jumps the queue. Are you tr basically privileging uh, involuntary treatment over voluntary treatment? Is that fair? So w with respect to the racial disparity question, we sort of just, you know, deconstructed, unpacked that, and uh, recalculated the racial disparity index using different denominators. So the denominator would be the county uh, population uh, with serious mental illness, you know, in, and then in the public system and in the Office of Mental Health. Then people in the county who uh, had been hospitalized and then people who had been involuntarily committed. And what you see is that as we distill down the denominator to a smaller, smaller group to, to where you get to the people who are typically uh, found to be eligible for outpatient commitment and put on it, um, you know, the, the whole system upstream is sorting people out by race for reasons that have to do with historical factors of, of discrimination and the and the uh, who's in the public system and the correlation between um, poverty and race. And so by the time you get to the decision maker, the judge who's deciding whether to issue outpatient commitment or not, that person could have a blindfold on and you're still going to get this racially disparate result because the, 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 uh, the, 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 the system factors are upstream. Now, again, this raises the question, though, in the end, even if we do have a disparate uh, d distribution by race on outpatient commitment, is that good or bad? Well, it might depend on how you see outpatient commitment. If you think it's a good thing, you think it's a way for people to access treatment who might be denied treatment, it might not bother you. If you think of it as coercion, then it might, you might think that's not good because it's piling on a group of people who've already been oppressed. And finally, you know, does outpatient commitment crowd out voluntary treatment? Well, um, you know, uh, this is kind of a complicated slide. I call it the, the Neapolitan ice cream slide. If you look at the pink wedge there at the bottom, and, the, and over the years as the, as the, as the uh, outpatient commitment system went into, uh, into operation in, uh, in New York, you see that all of the new capacity that was made available by this big appropriation, I think $100 million in New York, went to the people with the court orders. So, so those are the black and the brown wedges. Those are expanding and the other group is, is staying stable. So, and people's chance of staying on outpatient, uh, staying on uh, uh, an intensive case management situation or an assertive community treatment order, uh, basically that was affected in the first three years by how many people were coming in with the court orders. So you would think if you stop the evaluation there that there was this crowd out effect. But if you take it all the way out 10 years, the system sort of equilibrates. There's more capacity in the system. People graduate from outpatient commitment, shall we say. And in the end, more people, even who never qualified for outpatient commitment, do get these intensive services and are, uh, and are advantaged by that. Um, so now I'm going to turn it back to Larry, and we're just going to spend a couple of minutes talking about these policy guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. We could really use a couple more hours. There's so much material here. Uh, and it's wonderful, Jeff. 
Um, just very briefly, because we do want to leave some time for discussion, for questions. Uh, I just wanted to say just a word about uh, some guidelines that we developed, uh, included in our paper, uh, guidelines for states to follow, uh, you know, to implement commitment laws fairly uh, and effectively. Uh, and I'll just go through these kind of quickly there. Uh, first, as we said throughout, the purpose of, of all of this must be treatment. Uh, need for treatment is an essential element for commitment inpatient or outpatient. Uh, without a reliable diagnosis of a serious mental illness for which effective treatment is available, we should not be going down this road. Uh, no commitment solely for preventive detention or community control. There's been a lot of uh, talk about, you know, people who uh, are uh, at risk for gun violence. Can't we just commit them, you know, use civil commitment laws to commit these, put these people away? That would be a, really a misuse a civil commitment unless the person happens to have a serious mental illness that requires a you know a, a you know mandated uh, you know care. Um, no commitment. The person's willing and able to engage with services voluntarily. If the person's willing to go, we should not be using these laws. Uh, treatment staff should have the authority to terminate commitment whenever they think the person no longer needs it. Uh, you know the person may be subject to an order for commitment, but it's the treatment staff in the end who ought to make the call about whether this person needs to remain uh, in commitment. Uh, and the treatment staff should jump in and lose from the commitment if they believe the person no longer needs it. We shouldn't have courts uh, sort of overriding clinical judgments about what people may need who've been placed uh, uh, un under a commitment. Uh, no, inpatient commitment, all of those apply really across the board, inpatient or outpatient. Here we're talking about just inpatient commitment. And in a way, this guideline is, is in the nature of a kind of a standard for commitment. No inpatient commitment unless without a hospital level of care, the person's at significant risk in the foreseeable future of behaving in a way actively or passively that brings harm to the person or to others. Uh, not necessarily a risk of violent behavior, uh, maybe a risk of injury, illness, death, any kind of major loss, such as an inability to sort of care for self, something like grave disability, all of that is sort of factored in here. But we're looking at some degree, some risk that the person is going to present uh, a risk of harm uh, to, to self or to others in the foreseeable future. Uh, that's, that's the idea. The thinking was that you have to have something along these lines to justify taking the person's liberty uh, in this way. Uh, no uh, inpatient commitment if the person is able to make it in the community with the help of friends who are out there and who are available and willing to help. Uh, if the person is capable of remaining in the community without presenting these risks of harm, uh, then you can't justify an inpatient commitment. Uh, no inpatient commitment if there's a less restrictive alternative available, as we've discussed, including outpatient commitment. So that someone uh, who may be subject to, to a commitment who doesn't require uh, an inpatient hospital level of care should, uh, should not be admitted, uh, but rather should be served in the community. Uh, for outpatient commitment, no outpatient commitment unless either the person meets the inpatient commitment standard but doesn't require a hospital level of care. Uh, you know, that's the, the one kind of avenue to outpatient commitment that Jeff described earlier. And the other, the more preventive approach, without services, uh, it would be predictable that the person will experience further disability or deterioration to a degree that in the foreseeable future, they will meet the inpatient commitment standard. Uh, and so the guidelines suggest this is kind of a, in a way, a standard for, for outpatient commitment. Uh, and finally, that, you know, kind of insight and competence need to be considered, ought to be considered in every case. The guidelines don't go so far as to say that there must be a requirement that the person be incompetent, could be found to be incompetent uh, to make treatment choices before they would be subject to outpatient commitment. But it ought to be taken into account, particularly given that the, um, the risk of harm in these cases is less immediate. Uh, we ought to be at least considering uh, the degree to which the person's insight is a factor here. Uh, procedural guidelines, practices, you know, clearly uh, any kind of commitment practice should uh, respect privacy, dignity, minimize trauma. If police are used to transport someone to a hospital, uh, ideally they would use, you know, unmarked cars and uh, they would use plain clothes officers. Now, you know, that's often not, not possible. Often there's a crisis, the police are called, uh, the cars are marked, the officers are uniformed. But uh, if it is possible to arrange, and so many locations, so many communities across the country have this, uh, have a close working relationship between community mental health and law enforcement, that they have teams that can provide transport uh, and can use folks who, who minimize, uh, you know, that trauma.
shackles, restraints, only if necessary. Uh, the police routinely use these uh, in the criminal justice system when providing transport, uh, custody of someone, but it shouldn't be routine uh, in these cases, only if necessary. Uh, the person shouldn't be held pre-hearing in jail. Uh, this has been done historically, uh, shouldn't be done, except if the person happens to be in jail already, uh, is now the candidate for a commitment. Perhaps they can remain in jail until the bed opens up. Uh, commitment, uh, full due process uh, in, in, in these hearings. Um, this is pretty much in place everywhere, although I was on a, a conference call recently or a, a call uh, in which I was told that uh, in some communities, uh, counsel aren't necessarily present uh, when the hearings go forward. Uh, and that's a little surprise to me because I mean, this has been clearly recognized by the courts. It's required as a matter of due process whenever someone's subject to commitment. Uh, and then finally, most importantly, when a, a commitment ends, treatment staff need to connect the person with services uh, outside the commitment order, but the services the person may need to continue to make it in the community. Uh, all of this is uh, presented in a bit more detail in a paper that we did for SAMHSA, uh, and you can see the link here, uh, including these guidelines and more uh, with some discussion. So, you know, feel free to, uh, to download that, and if you're interested in seeing uh, all of this in more detail, we're going to have time for a few questions and some discussion, but if you have questions after we're done, here's our contact information. Uh, we're certainly available to communicate with you if you have any thoughts about, uh, about what we've had to say or have questions or suggestions. So thank you very much. I think at this point, uh, questions, and I think, Kelly, are you going to moderate this? I am. I am. And we do have one question. Uh, from Barbara, in the IDD field, there is a strong emphasis on person-centered care and self-directed care. Why do you think we have such a different approach for people with psychiatric disabilities? You want to take that, Jeff? Well, I, I think there are a lot of reasons, um, and uh, they're, they're, they're not all justifiable necessarily. Uh, I do think that if you go back historically, I mean, you can go back as long as far as, you know, uh, the history of mental illness in our civilization as you want, and you, and you find, you know, this mind-body problem that, that uh, you know, uh, people with mental illness are treated differently. Um, I also think maybe the, um, the culture in uh, IDD, I don't know um, that much about it, but I do think that... Um, that the the idea of um, pushing towards the goal of person-centered care and self-directed care is something that takes some time, and maybe it's on a bit of a different timeline. But you know, certainly uh, our group and others have tried to emphasize, um, you know, using legal tools like uh, psychiatric advance directives, where people can plan ahead for their own care during a, during a crisis. And, uh, you know, those laws are now available pretty much in every state. Uh, it's a matter of trying to get them to be used and to facilitate them. Um, I don't know uh, in terms of comparison, comparing specifically to the, um, you know, um, IDD world. Maybe, Larry, you can comment on that. But it certainly it, 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 thank you, Bibi, um, um, for that uh, uh, message, and I, I think that certainly is something that we need to consider and, and try to emphasize going forward. But, I, you know, I think the same philosophy uh, applies in the mental health treatment world as well. We've been talking about, you know, circumstances where the person uh, is not directing their, their care well, uh, and states sort of authorize them to jump in and direct uh, their care for them. Uh, but those are exceptional circumstances. I mean, you know, there are large numbers of people getting services within public mental health systems, not that many who are subject to these commitment laws. So I think that is, you know, the aspiration for all treatment providers is to get to the person to the point where they can make their own choices uh, about, you know, medications and all the rest. Uh, and it's only when circumstances are such that without the services, the person's rejecting uh, the person's at risk for some harm. And then the state, uh, exercising a parent's patriarchal responsibility, steps in on the person's behalf. Great, thank you. Um, Jeff, during your portion of the presentation, you used the term landlord. Uh, someone had a question, like just a question mark by that word. Can you elaborate a little bit on that word? Do you recall using it? I, I'm, it, it? I may have either misspoken or it might have been misheard or not clear, but 
a, a land board. I'm not sure what that refers to. Does somebody, can somebody help me? Land um, board? Stephen, he wrote landlord. Oh, landlord. L -A -N -D. Oh, okay, land. Uh huh, landlord. Yeah. Uh, um, well, that would be uh, someone who is, um, you know, someone who owns an apartment and is renting it out to a person with, um, with mental illness and as a condition of the lease can say to that person, well, I'm not going to let you live in my apartment uh, un unless you go to the mental health center and, and uh, participate in treatment. So I was providing that as an example where um, housing could be leveraged and sometimes is to try to uh, get someone to participate in treatment. Is that fair? Well, it's, maybe it's controversial, but it's not uh, so unusual, and it could be either formal or informal. Does that answer the question, hopefully? I think it does. Thank you. Um, we don't have, it looks like someone is typing, but we don't have any more questions at the moment. Was there anything else that either of you wanted to elaborate on before we ended? today's webinar? I just wanted to add one, one thing to the discussion uh, just a moment ago about self-determined care mm -hmm. and, uh, and patient-centered care and so on. And, and those are important values. I think it's important when we talk about civil commitment and outpatient commitment and, and inpatient commitment that we really are talking about a, a, a pretty small a minority of people who have a mental illness. It's a very small group. I mean, we're emphasizing it because we're talking about it, focusing on it. But, um, it, you know, if you look at the proportion of people now who get even get hospitalized and then those who get involuntarily committed, it is a, it is a small proportion. So it's important not to generalize and to suggest that what we're talking about, you know, is, is, is true of the, of the broad sweep of people, you know, who are re uh, recovering from mental illnesses. Yeah, I think the challenge for providers is to, you know, work, develop a good enough relationship uh, with their, you know, their patient that they can collaboratively uh, kind of plan for the person's services. Uh, and it's only when the person's not willing to or not capable of doing that, and that places the person at risk for harm, that these, these laws kick in. You know, uh, Jeff mentioned advanced directives. Uh, you know, there's lots of, you know, research on this. A lot of states are you know, have laws that you know, can be used for uh, someone to have a, a psychiatric advance directive uh, in which, you know, the person specifies their own plan uh, and the idea being, well, you know, the person's maybe more likely to adhere to the plan if it's their plan rather than one that's imposed upon them uh, by a court. So I think, you know, there is a real, you know, interest in, in promoting self-directed care. There just are limits, and when those limits are met, that's where these laws kick in. Thank you. Thank you. Are there training resources for judges? Judges have developed a real interest in a lot of this, I mean, particularly in the criminal justice system. You know, they're dealing with so many folks who cycle in and out. Uh, so that you see in judges' conferences pretty regularly now, folks talking about issues around accessing services, uh, particularly where the court may have the authority to order uh, someone off to services. Uh, but civil commitment, you know, is not as much on their radar uh, because, you know, they just encounter it less. So often the judges, though, who have responsibility for commitments are special judges. You know, they're judges who may have been appointed by the chief judge in the, uh, in the community or in the, in the region uh, to preside over these cases. And those judges typically do get have a first a pretty close working relationship with the mental health agency uh, and often do get uh, specialized training uh, in how to carry out their job. Um, but, you know, judges generally, you know, are, are not that literate uh, about this stuff. Uh, and, you know, even some judges who preside over mental health courts uh, in criminal cases so often don't really fully understand how the services system works and the array of needs a person may have, how to leverage, you know, the full sort of comprehensive package of services that will enable someone to make it uh, in the community. Jeff, did you want to add to that? No, I think that was, that was uh, well said. Okay, great. 
uh, there was another question. Um, what can mental health facilities do when the commitment order states to remain in mental health custody until next hearing or hearing date is up to court to decide that patient is already stable or does not meet criteria for commitment? In most states, the, the hospital has the authority to release the individual. Uh, I mean, it's sort of unusual that for an inpatient civil commitment order, uh, where it's not coming out of the criminal justice system, that the court uh, has the authority to insist over the objection of the facility that the person remains. Uh, so, you know, ordinarily the, the hospital, I mean, the, the judge may have the authority to place the person there, but once the person's placed there, it's, it's the hospital's call when they're to be released. Now, you know, if it is within the criminal justice system, so often courts, particularly if they're using something like competency to stand trial as the mechanism to get the off to the hospital, the judge will control uh, that release. Or if the person is civilly committed, for example, after being found to be incompetent to stand trial and not restorable in the foreseeable future, the courts have said that, you know, in that circumstance in a criminal case, you can't hold a person in treatment for purposes of restoring their competence, but you can civilly commit. Uh, in some states, the judges who order those civil commitments try, at least, to retain the authority to keep the person under a commitment order, even if the hospital says they're ready to go. Uh, and that's a problem. And maybe that's what, uh, you know, uh, the questioner's alluding to. Okay. We have time for one more question. It comes from Evan. Can you comment on, excuse me, applicability of civil commitment in patients with well-established histories of violence associated with mental illness, but a lack of recent overt acts of violence. They are facing a great deal of pressure from their public defender regarding them looking over, I'm sorry, looking for overt acts in the recent past. There's a little more added there, but I wanted to um, give you time to respond. That's yeah, interesting. I mean, that's and interesting. Go ahead. Go ahead, Larry. Yeah. No. Go ahead, Jeff. So, um, yeah, I was just going to comment on what that made me think of is, you know, when we uh, did our study here in North Carolina, uh, where we had a, a, a design of a randomized trial where someone, you know, essentially we say to the person, um, if you sign up for this study, we're going to flip a coin. If you get heads, you know, you, you, you win and you get to not have the uh, outpatient commitment. You just get a case manager voluntarily. The, um, the IRB and the re review committee required that we exclude people from the randomized uh, part of the study if they had a history of violence, a history of serious violence. It was identified at that point. We did include them in a separate arm of the study, all of them being on outpatient commitment. But what we learned, you know, in the course of, uh, of doing this is that um, what we know about violence is sometimes, uh, you know, uh, it depends on what, what source you're looking at. We, we asked the collateral informant about this person's history of violence. We asked the, we looked at the hospital record. Does this person say, you know, history of assaulted behavior? We interviewed the people themselves. And, you know, about 25% of the uh, population in the hospital there uh, were identified as having some history of violence, but those sources of information didn't quite agree. When you when you uh, put them all together, then you got a much you know larger percentage. And um, there were indications that the history, the documented history in the hospital, um, you know, was kind of racially discriminatory because uh, black patients were far more likely to have that written in their in their record than white patients were, and things like that. So, you know, I think it's a complicated issue um, also because what we know is violent behavior, uh, you know, mental illness is a very small uh, uh, part of the kind of motivational uh, array of things that can increase the risk for violence. It's usually all these other things. I mean, if, if we were to cure mental illness, you know, violence in society would go down by about 4%. So it's hard to attribute it to mental illness along the lines that, you know, Larry was talking about before, need for treatment. Um, you know, most people, even if they have a serious mental illness, the reasons uh, that they might be violent might be the same reasons everybody else is violent. Uh, so those are some kind of free associations on the problem. I don't know the specific, um, you know, uh, legal quandary about it. Uh, Larry, you may be able to comment uh, on it. Well, if we have just, just a moment, I mean, I, it is interesting. I, the question I think is interesting that uh, this is still, 
uh, the commitment hearings still play this way. I mean, it's, it's so interesting that, you know, years ago, I mean, the concern, the focus really was on this person's risk for violent behavior is evidenced by a recent overt act or threat. Uh, you know, and that still is part of the law, you know, in, in, so in a number of states. But it's surprising to me that it's, it's operationalized very strictly. Uh, I mean, if a person is, is really quite ill and really needs to be uh, in a hospital level of care because they're at risk of some sort of harm, even if it's not, you know, uh, overt violent behavior, uh, it, it's surprising to me that that very often, that person very often would, would not be committed. Uh, but, I mean, I suppose where um, there are aggressive attorneys and uh, libertarian judges that, you know, this individual described here may not be committed despite uh, a real, uh, you know, deterioration in their, in their mental condition and need for, for a psychiatric intervention. Uh, on the other hand, if, if the concern here really is just making sure somebody who's been violent in the past is locked up in a way so they can't act out again, without so much regard for their uh, immediate need for a hospital level of psychiatric care, then I understand the, uh, you know, the, uh, then I understand the question better. And I would just add one thing. Um, we do know that a history of violence is probably the best predictor of future violence. We also know that the, the, the longer the, the, the time passes from the history of violence, the more that correlation between past and present behavior uh, decays. So, you know, the, if, it's, if it's violent behavior in the, you know, it was three months ago versus a year ago versus two years ago, um, it's going to be much less predictive. And so if the idea is to try to use that as a predicate for um, protecting someone now, um, you know, it does matter how long ago it was, notwithstanding that history of violence is, you know, is a stronger predictor than, well, in psychopathology, per se. Great. Well, Larry and Jeff, thank you so much for today's presentation. Um, I definitely appreciate uh, just your knowledge and just um, everything that you shared with the group today. Um, this recording and the slides will be sent to all participants uh, within a day or two. And um, at this time, we are going to switch the screen to a short evaluation and ask that you take a few moments just to let us know how you enjoyed today's presentation. Um, I would like to thank SAMHSA again for allowing us to share this information with you today. And enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Larry and Jeff, please stand by.